And over the past two or so years, uh, two or three years, we've been interested in particular in looking at non-associative extensions. And so this is what uh, Latham started to introduce in his last talk. So this is a two-part talk. Uh, whereas he outlines the formalism, I'm going to be outlining a number of the applications. Okay? And, and so before I begin, I, I must apologize. Originally, I had a presentation, but um, there were sufficiently many things I, I had to in, introduce to my talk uh, that I have now changed it into a Blackboard discussion. Um, it's just because Latham and I didn't actually coordinate last night. <laughs> but it should be fine. So I'm going to begin. Uh, by first just giving uh, an overview of what I'm going to be talking about. So to start with, I'm just going to give a, a very, very short recap uh, of what Latham had to say. And in particular, I'm going to focus on a few motivations that were not discussed. Um, and then I'm going to go into just recapping very, very quickly. And in particular, I'm going to be talking about uh, some of the constraints that arise that Latham uh, introduced. After I've given uh, this brief recap, I'm then going to uh, go ahead and give my uh, main part of the presentation, which is I'm going to discuss uh, a few of our applications. So uh, th there are two applications I want to speak about, and, and they have to do with the Higgs sector of standard model particles. So there, there are two problems that arise. Right, the first one is, uh, as Latham described, uh, there are three steps in producing uh, physical theory as a non-computed differential geometry. Oh, sorry, two steps. One, you select the algebra. Two, you select the representation. And then you can use the axioms to generate your Dirac operator and, and therefore the Higgs sector. But there's a problem in, in Kant's approach, and that is that when you do this, you get too many Higgs fields. So the first problem I want to talk about is too many Higgs. He, he removes some Higgs fields essentially by hand. The second problem I want to talk about is this 170 GeV uh, Higgs mass prediction. Okay, so, so the, the problems are twofold. First of all, you get too many Higgs fields. But then once you've removed some of the Higgs fields by hand and you check, uh, you can compute the, the mass, you, you get it wrong. Right? So these are two pretty big problems uh, in the Higgs sector. Okay, so, so let, let, me, uh, let me begin with a little bit of a, a recap. So two years ago, uh, Latham and I, two, two or three years ago, Latham and I became very interested in uh, non commutative differential geometry. And in particular, we became interested in the standard model of particle physics embedded as a non commutative differential geometry. And the reason why we became so excited uh, with this model was that the majority of Young Mills theory right, did not admit a geometric interpretation. Right, the majority of Young Mills theories you can't write down as a non commutative differential geometry because there are geometric constraints that have to be satisfied. Okay? And so, uh, as, as Latham mentioned, originally we, we had the understanding that everything that had to be done or could be done in the non commutative standard model had been done. Right? There was nothing left to explore, and so we were interested in using the model, the, the constraints, to explore beyond the standard model physics. That was our original goal. And so if you have this goal, you have to be very, very careful. Right? You have to make sure you completely understand the axioms. You, you need to be able uh, to distinguish between those axioms which arise naturally as a gen generalization from R Ramanian geometry and those which are imposed in sort of an ad hoc fashion, right? those which aren't natural. And this is very important. And so early on, uh, uh, we, we saw the, uh, the axiom of associativity, right? imposing associativity on your input algebra by axiom, we saw that as being unnatural. And there are two main motivations for this. The first one, uh, Latham did describe, so that, that is that if you're interested in non commutative differential geometry and, and extending the same model of particle physics, then you should be interested in many of the models that already exist. So, grand unified theories, uh, supersymmetry, left right symmetric models, things like this. And what we found was that many of the uh, models that were of most interest 
were completely ruled out by the formula. So just to give another example, uh, Latham mentioned grand unified theory. So one very popular grand unified theory is based on the, the symmetry group E6. Well, the exceptional groups all arise as automorphism groups of non-associative algebra. Right, so if I want to obtain an E6 grand unified model, then I'm stuck unless I am able to input non-associative algebra. Okay? E6 is the automorphism group of a, an algebra called the Brown algebra, whose structure I don't really know much about, so don't ask me about that. But in any case, so the, the, the first motivation uh, was physical. We wanted to extend the formalism such that we could obtain access to a broad range of models that we saw as being accessible. Now, the, the, the other motivation uh, is, is more mathematical, and that is that uh, usually when you construct a physical theory, what you do in, in effective field theory is you start by a symmetry group. Right? Latham gave his three steps. You select the symmetry group, you select the fermions, you select, select the um, representations of the scalar fields. Okay? But in non commutative differential geometry, what you do instead is you select an algebra. And the symmetries of your theory arise in the automorphisms of that algebra. Right? And so if we have this nice algebraic formalism, why restrict attention uh, to the associative algebras, since many of the most interesting algebras are non-associative, Lee, Jordan, Octonian, for example. Okay, so, so those were our two motivations to begin with. This is why we, we started down this path. Okay, so now what I want to uh, do is just, is just briefly uh, recall what Latham did, because I'm not sure if everyone was here in the last talk. But very, very briefly, whenever you're constructing a geometry, you have to start by giving some input data. So in Ramanian geometries, that's a manifold and a metric. In non commutative differential geometry, what you give is a spectral triple, right? which consists of an algebra, a Hilbert space, and a Dirac operator. Right? And the idea is, the idea that was discussed in, in, in Latham's talk, is that you form a fused algebra. Right? And there, there are two benefits to doing this. The first is, is that non-associative algebras are well-defined. Right? So as soon as you can describe your input data in terms of an algebra, you're then able to describe it in terms of a non-associative algebra. Right? So the, the first benefit is this formalism, as Latham described, generalizes the non-associative case. The second benefit is that when you restrict your attention to the associative case, you then obtain some of Kahn's axioms that he gives sort of piecewise. Right? Some of them become, in some sense, derivable. Okay, so, so those are the two benefits. The axioms and non-associative geometry. Okay, so, so this, this is, uh, in broad stroke, the outline of what uh, Latham had to say in his talk. Right? So what I want to talk about is, is something that uh, we skipped over when we first were interested in this formalism. Right? And that is the problems that occur uh, when you're trying to construct the standard model of particle physics as a non-commutative geometry, right? Originally, we thought there were no problems, but, but there are a number of problems. And what we found is that, you know, trying to incorporate the added complexity of non-associative algebras forced us to construct a formalism that was simple, right? And, and it, this simple formalism, when you, when you apply it to, it, it, it's, it's uh, clarifying enough that when you apply it to the associative case, you actually learn something, right? And, and, and this, is, this is how we're able to solve some of these problems, or at least propose solutions to some problems that currently exist. Okay. You can all hear me fine? Okay. So, let me start with this first problem up here. Too many people. Okay, so uh, as, as Latham discussed uh, in his talk, one of the most beautiful things about non commutative differential geometry for a particle theorist is that it offers uh, a, a means of constraining which mo models are accessible. Right? In particular, the Higgs sector is for the most part completely constrained, but not, com not completely constrained. Okay? So, so the idea is that you, you take some spectral triple, Right, which consists of an algebra and its representation on H, in which I'll include J and gamma. Right. And you use the axioms to constrain the form of D. Right. And then you replace D 
with a fluctuated Dirac operator or a Dirac operator in our language which acts covariantly with respect to the automorphisms of B, our fused algebra. And usually when you're constructing a, uh, a physical theory uh, as a non-commutative differential geometry, you do it as an almost commutative geometry, which means that your Dirac operator has two parts. Right, there's a continuous part and what I'll call finite part. Okay. And when you're constructing the standard model of particle physics, this is literally just a matrix and, and you use the ax axioms to constrain that matrix. Now, your gauge fields come about from the fluctuation of this term here. And your Higgs terms come out from the fluctuation of this term here. So let's just see what happens. Uh, one of the reasons why I turned this into a blackboard talk is because Latham said that I was going to give the representation of uh, the algebra, and I didn't have that on my slides, so, and various other things. But so I'm not going to give the representation the standard model. I'm going to give it for an electric weak theory because it's just easier to write down. And the story is exactly the same. I understand model particle physics. So for an electric weak theory, you, you take your finite spectral triple and you tensor it with a continuous spectral triple uh, to form an almost commutative geometry, right? And the finite data is given as follows. Your finite algebra is given by the complex numbers plus the determinants. Right? If, if we were building the standard model, we'd also add three by three complex matrices. Now, the representation for the electroweak model is as follows. If I have, if I want to represent some algebra element, lambda q, where lambda is in C and q is in H, the, the Kernan, in my representation, I took this out of Wolfe's book, this thing, uh, Kuhn's book, is as follows. Whereas the real structure operator is as follows. And the grading <coughs> is as follows. Right? And the basis that I'm going to select for all these to act on will be the right handed leptons, left handed leptons, left right handed anti leptons, left handed anti leptons. The, the details are not necessarily important. All you need to know is that there's a representation of an algebra, my real structure, and a gradient. And then what I can do is I can determine the form of D, dF, uh, using the following conditions. So if uh, my, my Dirac operator has to commute with my real structure up to some epsilon prime, right? it has to anti commute with the grading. Yeah, my apologies. So this Q lambda, Q is a matrix of this form. Uh, it's an embedding of the quaternions and two by two uh, complex matrices, and Q lambda is of the form lambda lambda bar. The, the, the details are not important. It's just there's, there's a um, the representation of some algebra. The, the same description would happen whatever the model was that we picked. In any case, there, there are some conditions uh, that have to be satisfied uh, by D, gamma, and J, including an order one condition. <coughs> right, and hermeticity with D. And in the electroweak theory, what would happen is if we imposed all these conditions, we would obtain a Dirac operator that looks like Now, if we were building an electric weak theory, these terms would eventually result in the Higgs field. And this term here would eventually result in Majorana mass term. The problem is this, this matrix here, M, has unwanted terms inside it. It looks like this. Right? It has terms that are not set to zero by the constraints. And the point is, in the standard model, you get even more terms. Right? If I wrote out the full representation of the standard model and went through this process, 
I would get additional terms which would be coupling between uh, left-handed quarks and right-handed uh, leptons, this sort of thing. Things that are completely unphysical and would not be viable as a, as a model of physics. Okay? Um, and so what Kohn does and, and what Shamsuddin does is, is they have what's called uh, a massless photon condition, which essentially is they remove these terms by hand. Uh, and they, they, they say this in their paper, why the standard model. So I'm not knocking them, this is their observation. And, and so what, what we find is we have a solution to this problem in our formulas. Okay. And the solution is the following. W was that clear to everyone? Understandable? Yeah, I'm leaving it up there. So thank you. Okay, so when Latham described uh, used algebra B, he told you that if, if uh, we wanted to impose two conditions, the associativity of B and also that B is involutive, then we get you know, the order zero condition, the order one condition, but we also get some additional conditions. Right, if we want B to be associative, then for example, an N form has to associate with an M form on the Hilbert space. And in particular, this gives us a new condition of the form where A and B are arbitrary elements of the algebra, J is your real structure, and D is your Dirac operator. Now, it turns out if you impose, Im, impose this condition on the Dirac operator, it kills off every single one of those terms that you don't want, all the unphysical terms, and leaves the ones behind that you do want. Okay? So if you're gonna, if you're gonna motivate some, some, uh, some new axioms, then they better do the correct thing, and these ones do. Okay, so, so this is the first problem I wanted to talk about. Um, It, for example, in, in the associative case, if I had taken, just as an example, omega uh, 2 and omega 1, for example, then I would have had a, a term that looks like this. Right. But... Uh, um, commutators act as derivations, and so this would have been solved by this condition. Um, okay, so th that's the first thing I wanted to say. Uh, that's, that's the first application uh, about formalism, and it's in the associative case. So the next thing I want to talk about is this 170 GeV Higgs, and this is something that uh, Fidele has been talking about. This is something that uh, was mentioned by Christoph and, al and also uh, by Latham. And it's, uh, it's a problem that's already had a few solutions uh, given in the literature by a number of people. Um, the Tilda Market Collie gives gravitational corrections to the, to the running of the constants. Uh, Shamsuddin and Kohn uh, introduced this new scalar field, sigma, in order to increase the parameter space and allow the model to be. Um, to be compatible with the 125 GeV uh, detection. And this is, this is the solution that I'm most interested in, and it's the solution that other people uh, have been talking about today. So the basic idea uh, that Kohn and Chomsudin had uh, in their Resilience of the Center Model paper, I think it was called, was to take the center model and introduce a new scalar field. And this was a real scalar field which was uncharged underneath the symmetries of the center model. And uh, as I said, the, the, the idea was to increase the parameter space of the model. Right? You've got couplings in the, in the potential between the two scalar fields. And the increased parameter space allows you to make the model compatible with the 125 uh, GeV uh, detection. The problem with this solution is that uh, it breaks one of the most beautiful features of non-commuted differential geometry. One of the most beautiful features is that you obtain your, your Higgs fields as output. You fluctuate them. You turn them on using your symmetries. 
Whereas they turned on a, a field by hand, which had it, it wasn't charged under any of the symmetries of the standard model. Right? It didn't natu naturally fluctuate. And, uh, and so some people have had solutions to this. So just for example, Fidele um, has this nice paper. This is how I started thinking about these things, actually, originally. Um, where what they did is, he talked about this morning, uh, he increased the, he, he changed the algebra uh, for the model, and the increased symmetry that you obtain fluctuates that sigma field. This is my understanding of your paper anyway, correct me if I'm wrong. And, 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 and it's a nice idea, and, 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 and so you, you can fluctuate this real sigma field in their model as well. But, uh, so, so uh, this brings about a possibility, you know, what if uh, the symmetry group of the standard model itself it, 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 of the input data of the standard model itself uh, is a little bit larger. Okay? And so in our formalism, the natural symmetry are the automorphisms of the fused algebra B. Right, this is your input data, so it's natural that the symmetries of your theory will be the automorphisms of this algebra. And so just in brief, what we find is that if you take the, the input data of the standard model of the particle physics, you, you form its fused algebra, right? And then you look at its automorphisms, these automorphisms naturally fluctuate the sigma field. So you get an extra U1 gauge field, which is baryon minus lepton number. And uh, the sigma field, which is responsible for Majorana masses, picks up a charge of plus two underneath this, this um, symmetry, and, and it naturally fluctuates. And so that's what I want to describe now. Okay. So the automorphisms uh, of B, the, the grading pre uh, preserving automorphisms of B, I'll just remind you, B can be written as follows. The Hilbert space I'll call omega infinity, just to uh, maintain compatibility with what, what Latham was saying. So if this is my fused algebra, the automorphisms, the grading preserving automorphisms, which I'll write in the following form, have the following property. So my automorphisms have to satisfy So what I want to do is find out uh, generally uh, what automorphisms on B for the standard model look like. And so what I'm going to look at to start with is their infinitesimal generators, right, their derivation on, on B. And uh, in, this, in, in, the, in the language of derivations, these conditions here translate to the following. So I have <coughs> infinitesimal generators in, in my automorphisms, which are the general form delta of naught plus delta 1, right? and these have to satisfy the following property. So if I take the Leibniz property, right? and another property Evolutive property, I don't know what you'd call it. Right. And you can translate these uh, for the term uh, delta infinity here as follows. Right. Delta infinity must uh, commute with J. Right. And we also uh, are interested in, in the uh, transformations which are orientation preserving or reversing particular the orientation uh, preserving transformations, which have the following condition that must satisfy. And uh, also the Leibniz condition translates in this language to the following. If I take the commutator of delta infinity with the left action of an n-form, 
then this has to be equal to the left action of delta n acting on, on the end point. Okay. So my simple Leibniz uh, conditions and this involutive condition and it, uh, translates to this condition and this condition, then I'm asking also that these variations are orientation to reference. So they can mutually gamma. And so these are the, the conditions that I impose, and then I just need to take the standard model and see what I get. So, I guess it will erase this out. We're done with that anyway. All right. How much time do I have? Plenty of time. Okay, so, so the basic idea here is I want to find the, these derivations on my standard model. So the first thing uh, to note is that the standard model, uh, I take some input algebra, which is the algebra of complex numbers plus the quaternions plus the three by three complex matrices. Uh, this, is a, uh, this is a finite uh, associative algebra, and so I know the form of its inner derivations. The inner derivations are of the form <coughs> LA minus RA, right, where A is just an element of the algebra itself, and LA and RA are just left and right action of algebra elements. So you can write this as a commutator. So when I'm writing out my derivation, right, in this form up here, I can write my, my general form of my derivation very simply as LA minus RA, right, so the, the order zero guys, because I know that all the inner derivations, that all the derivations are in there and they're of this form plus delta 1 plus etc. delta infinity. Okay, and now I can use my Leibniz condition up the top here to determine the form of delta infinity. Yeah, sorry, I should have specified. So uh, at the moment I'm just looking at the finite part of the standard model. Okay. okay. So I have my Leibniz condition up here that I can use, which translates uh, to this condition over here. So, acting on a zero form, my delta infinity elements will be of the form, well, I'll call this element X, so I don't confuse it with this A over here. This would be of the form A comma X, okay, which I can write as Now, I already know in the associative case that my left action commutes to my right action. Right? So I know that the general form of my derivations then are going to be delta infinity equals left A minus RA, acting on the Hilbert space, plus T. T is just an element which commutes with all elements of the algebra. Okay? So that's the first condition that I have. And so now I, I know what these elements will give me. These are just my inner derivations in the regular case. So they'll give me my SU3 cross SU2 cross U1 gauge group. Th they will generate that group, the, the group of the standard model. This T is something extra, and I want to see if it's non-trivial. Okay. So the next thing I do is I can uh, use these conditions up here. So I have that T, whatever it is, has to satisfy, it has to commute with the grading, it has to commute with the real structure, has to commute with the left action, and it has to commute with the right action. Right. And so I'm going to do this for, I'm not going to do it for the standard model, I'll do it again for the electro, electro weak model just because it's much simpler. So if we go back to the electro weak model, Do you guys get bored by slow manipulation of things on the board? Probably, right? <laughs> I'll try to speed it up. <laughs> Sorry? Just relax. Relax, yeah. <laughs> so I should go slower.
We're not in the Mediterranean anymore, so. Okay, so again, just to be pedantic then, um, if I take the same representation again <coughs> for my electroweak theory, right? So I've got my representation of my algebra element, my real structure. Grading. Okay. So I start off with some operator P, which is just a general matrix. At this point, it's just a general matrix, and we want to use these four conditions here to constrain it. So if we take this Im uh, elements of this form uh, and these two operators here, what we find is that T can have the general form. A, well, sorry, C, something different. C, E, and that's in this upper column here, this upper element there. F, I2, minus C, E, minus F, I2. Right? And so this is starting to look a little bit like B minus L, right? On the uh, any particle, on the particles that have a minus the charge on the particle. Right, so this is starting to look nice. And this is, remember again, it's just the electroweak theory, so there's no uh, baryons in this, uh, sorry, no quarks in, yeah, no, no baryons in this uh, model. So then you could ask, how do we constrain this model further? And there's two ways. So this is an interesting part of formalism that uh, we haven't really quite ironed out yet. Um, it's just an interesting observation. So there's two ways to restrict this model to B minus L. The first one is as follows. If this was the center model, what you could now do is impose anomaly uh, uh, constraints. Right? Anomaly constraints then give you exactly what you want. They, they set C equals E equals F, and then also for the quarks, you'd, your charges would be one third of what you get to the left, left one. Right? Anomaly constraints would do that for you. The first, the first thing you do is could do is you can pose uh, anomaly constraints, which is a condition of this form. Right. The first thing you could do is 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 um, look at the quantum theory and make sure it's compatible with the the um, classical theory. The second thing you could do is as following follows. So far, I've only used the Leibniz condition acting on zero forms. I haven't used the higher order forms. And so I have the additional condition that uh, delta infinity, or this T operator, and I'm ignoring the inner um, derivations for now, this, this derivation operator acting on an, an N form has to be equal to the left action of some other N form. That condition is enough to set, in the electroweak model, C equals E equals F. Uh, they, they constrain and give you exactly the same constraints that you'd get from anomaly cancellation. In the standard model, it gets you almost there. You should still have to set the difference between the quarks and, uh, and leptons, so this one-third factor. Right? And, and that's set by either unimodularity or the uh, anomaly cancellation. So, so that, that's, just, that's just an interesting uh, point it seems uh, it, it seems as, as though you might be able to get to some of these anomaly constraints using geometric arguments, but uh, it's up in the air. We, we haven't looked further into this. It's just an interesting observation. Okay, uh, so I, I told you at the beginning that what happens is that these uh, generators will, will, will generate some new U1 symmetry, and this new U1 symmetry fluctuates the sigma field. That was the whole goal at the outset. And so I should probably show you that that occurs. Are there any questions while I pause? So when, where he just took general unitaries? 
Yeah, so this is actually originally how I found these. I was looking for just general unitary. Yeah, I, I, I don't know enough about the central extensions, but yeah, I think they might be the same thing. Uh, but he gets a different U1, right, Christoph? And that, that's, that's the reason, when you emailed me and you asked about this, I, I wasn't so sure exactly what to say, because yeah, he gets a different, so I'm, I'm not exactly sure. I think they must be the same, but... Yeah. So it only appears if you've added these new fermion. If, if, if you have you checked that? Do you know if it's been myself? Do you know what the answer is? Do you know what the answer is? Do you know if it's been myself? Well, we'd want the breaking to happen via the sigma field, right? And for yeah, it to be heavy enough. Are you, are you able to fix the um, unification uh, point yeah. with the extra U? Well, they, they have to commute with the left and right action. So, so there could be something there. Okay, so um, again, I'm going to uh, concentrate on the electroweak theory because it's just simpler to write down. Um, but as I said, everything extends to the center model. So, um, so just writing down the Dirac operator again, we use our trick, right? We use our high order conditions to constrain D, right? And what we have is the following. Uh, with the zeros everywhere else. Now, the 
point is that when, when you're looking at uh, the automorphisms, what have I done wrong? Uh, what have I done? <laughs> It's not associative. Um, <laughs> okay, so um, <laughs> okay, so so my automorphisms, if you remember, I wrote down as follows. Right? I wrote um, zero element plus half infinity, and so under the transformations, uh, under these automorphisms, the Dirac operator transforms as alpha infinity, the alpha infinity where alpha infinity is the exponentiation of one of the basis elements uh, with some coefficient uh, for the generators that we take, right? Now, you can write this out as an uh, expansion, which I sometimes get wrong, <coughs> but something like this. Right? And so, what you want is that when D commutes with your generators, that uh, these terms are affected. Right? If these terms aren't affected, they're, they're not going to be fluctuated. And that's, that's the key point. And if you just write down uh, the generators of the standard model gauge group, right, they're of this form. Right, where X is just a general input algebra element, right? Hermitian, uh, anti-Hermitian, sorry. If you if you simply look at uh, d commuted with delta infinity of this form, uh, this term here, this Majorana term, is completely unaffected. Right? It, just, it just commutes to zero. And so it, it will never fluctuate underneath the standard model gauge group. You're, you Instead, what you could do is look at this generator up here, after we impose the anomaly transform. F, well, F, I have four minus F, I have four, right? And if we just work it out, it's pretty quick to work out, so, right? The, the Higgs fields are unaffected, so they commute to zero, in other words. Uh, these terms up here go to two times F M, essentially, right? So you get two, uh, the charge is uh, two, uh, yeah, two times for B minus L, two times what you'd get on the, um, minus two times what you'd get for the uh, right-handed left hand. Okay. So, so that, that's, that's the simple point. That's, that's all I really wanted to say about uh, that particular uh, extension of the center model which pops out from our formulation. No, so so all the leptons yeah. will get minus one charge, okay. and all the uh, all the quarks will get uh, plus a third, plus a third, okay. uh, and then the the sigma field will get uh, plus two. So it doesn't have a coupling between quarks and leptons. It, it, it just couples right-handed neutrinos to each other. It gives you the, your mayor on a math term. Okay, so, so remember to start with, I told you that there were scalar fields, uh, there were too many scalar fields, right, in the model. So our higher order conditions kill all those terms. Okay. All the ones that you don't want get killed, okay. yeah. 
So, so that's the, it's, it's, it's the combined effect, right? The, the fact that it, we have these additional conditions and the additional symmetries that give you uh, a working model. Um, all right, well, I'm, I'm going to finish up pretty soon. There's only uh, one or two quick things I wanted to say. So you get an early reprieve of five minutes or something. But um, so the first thing is, uh, you know, so we, we, we went through this procedure for the standard model. But you could do the same thing for the, um, the canonical spectral triple, right? And, and what you find is a generator of uh, uh, local... Um, local Lorentz transformations. Right? So um, you, you can generate your spin connection, essentially. We haven't worked out whether we can get a metric compatible torsion free spin connection yet, but that, this is something we're talking about with Christoph, and uh, it, it's on the cards, um, something we're playing around with. Um, another thing is uh, I've been quite interested uh, recently in uh, your Paddy Salam type model, and so I have a few uh, interesting ideas there. Um, so, again, one, one of the things that I, I think is quite beautiful uh, about transformalism is that you're able to obtain the Higgs field through, through the aggregate. And one of the, um, you know, we, we were originally quite interested in uh, Grand Unified Theory, so we're interested in your Petty Slime model, but also other Grand Unified Theory. And uh, one of the interesting, well, one of the beautiful things about Grand Unified Theories is they, they give a really economic description of the fermionic sector. But the, the Higgs sector is disgusting. Right? You get so many fields, uh, in order to get the break in the work, you get this disgusting proliferation of fields that you don't, they're just not pretty. Um, and so it's an interesting point to me that when you construct the Paddy Salam model, for example, you have to break the geometry or you break the order one condition in order to accommodate these extra fields, right? So I, I've, I've had, uh, I've been having ideas of, of maybe you could uh, do different things, right? Maybe do the breaking through, uh, you know, Technicolor or something like this. I'm not, I'm not so sure. But um, we've been having other ideas following up on your papers to do with uh, the pace alarm model. And, and this is a general feature. The more complicated your, your algebra is, the more difficult it is to fit your Higgs fields around it. So... This is something that we've been, uh, well, I've been thinking about quite a bit recently. But um, otherwise, I think I'm going to leave it at that. Um, so these are some interesting applications that we've come out of our non-associative geometries. Uh, if anyone's curious, I can go through and actually show you how to build non-associative geometries. I haven't actually talked about that at all today. Um, this has all been in the associative case. So if you're curious, come speak to me or later. Anyway, thank you.
Ah, uh, yeah. You mean the input algebra? Input. Yeah, yeah. So um, I think Latham said it pretty well, so I'm just going to steal from him. Tell me if this is the wrong interpretation. But I heard that no. the solution was just going to random bits, but that's a very common thing. You read one of those two algebras, and you read one of those Yeah. Uh, right. So, but, but so the, the comment that Latham made that uh, I, I had not heard him say before, but I, I think it's a, a rather nice way of putting it, is that um, you know now with this formalism we're able to uh, explore what are the what are the associativity constraints that uh, that I'm not satisfied. Right. It turns out that the uh, the constraints that correspond well to the Turner model are associativity yeah, constraints. But then there's another very interesting thing, and that's in the continuous case. When you just start, when you just create a commutative canonical triple, then the associativity axioms are not satisfied. Yeah. So, what is the simplest non-associative non geometry you can write down? Uh, Ramanian geometry. So, <laughs> um, and there's a, a very, very, very interesting thing that comes out uh, that I don't understand at all. So, I have this. Latham and I have this description for how we get the generators of symmetry, right? And what you can do is you can construct, uh, you can represent uh, omega A on H. And then you can uh, mod out by the junk form. Regardless of whether you do that or not, regardless of whether you mod out by the junk form, you get the same uh, generators of symmetry. And that, in my mind, is extremely weird and something I'd love to understand. But I, I really don't understand that point at all. I don't know if this is uh, something rather general that mathematicians know about that I have understanding of, but it, it's something very, very interesting that's come up in that non-associative case. One more question? Yeah. So the only, the only time that I used those terms uh, was, you know, at the very end when I was, uh, I said there were these two methods of getting uh, to B minus L, you could either impose anomaly ca cancellation or you could uh, use the higher order form. So that's the only place I use them. But in general, I don't actually know their form at all. So um, that's an interesting question. I, I, I don't know the answer. Well, at the, at the end of the day, you're interested in the, in the, well, at the end of the day, you're interested in the automorphisms that uh, transform D, right? And D is an operator on H, so you're interested on in uh, uh, delta infinity. Um. Yeah. Oh, the Kruchowski diagram. So I, have, I, I need to go and read those papers. Uh, Christoph told me about them, but I'm, I'm not so familiar. We, we haven't done the analysis, but probably the answer is yes. But it would be, this is what you can write down for a, a Jordan algebra, or pr probably you'd, I, I, would ha I would say that probably what Thomas did, uh, is Thomas Krajewski? Yeah. Probably what he did is for the associative case, and then you can generalize this. But yeah, I, I haven't looked. I haven't looked. Well, Richard. <laughs> okay, if one more question. We're actually dead on time. So.
So I have been playing around with this a little bit. Um, and I have a few proposals, and none of them work. <laughs> but um, it, it, it'd be best, because uh, I'd have to actually go back and think about it again to write out exactly what my proposals are. But if you come speak to me, I've, I've got a few of them that you might be interested in. Yeah, where does Pencil Future?